Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee in 2018. Could I ask all people present to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? I would like to mention that apologies have been received from Gail Ross and Stuart Stevenson. The first item on the agenda is a declaration of interest. First of all, I'd like to welcome Maureen Watt to her first meeting of the REC Committee and invite Maureen as a new member of the committee to declare any interest relevant to the committee's remit. This is in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct for Members. Maureen. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you for the welcome. I'm delighted to be on the committee. Um, as some people will know, I am a farmer's daughter and my brother still farms, but I have no financial interest in it whatsoever. Thank you. I'd also like at this stage uh, to record the committee's thanks to Kate Forbes uh, for her contribution to the committee's work uh, during the time that she was on it. I'd like to now move on to agenda item two, which is uh, on the Transport Scotland Bill. And uh, this is our first evidence session on the Transport Scotland Bill, and the committee will take evidence from the Scottish Government officials. The evidence taking on this item will be structured in three parts today, recognising the large number of topics contained within the Transport Bill. Part one will cover buses and smart ticketing. Part two will cover low emission zones and parking. And part three will cover roadworks, canals and regional transport partnerships. During the course of this meeting, Scottish Government officials will change over, but I'd like to welcome for the first session from the Scottish Government, uh, Tasha Geddy, uh, Transport Scotland Bill Team, uh, Peter Grant, uh, Team Leader for Bus Policy, Gordon Hanning, the Head of Integrated uh, Ticketing Unit, Kevin Gibson, a solicitor, and Alison Martin, also a solicitor. So we'd I'd move on to the first question, um, on this, which will be from John Finney. John. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel. Uh, panel, I'm going to ask questions about uh, buses and smart ticketing. <clears throat> I'd be very keen to understand uh, how you believe the bill will improve the provision for lifeline rural bus services, please. So, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I felt you were all experienced. You'd, it, if you just look at me, um, I'll call you in and uh, then the microphone will be activated automatically for you, unless it's a logical sequence and, and Tasha sort of shifts the responsibility to somebody else. So, Peter, if you'd like to crack on on that one. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, the bill tries to set out um, new and improved options for local authorities in terms of how they address bus services in their area. Um, there are three tools that we set out, uh, the first one being a new partnership model, um, the second one being access to local franchising, um, that's where the local authority would compete the, the market for bus services at set times in the year. Um, the third one is for a local authority to run bus services directly or via arm's length um, in the case where those are supported services, um, not in the case where those are commercial services. The bill also offers um, provisions on uh, information for uh, bus users um, so that uh, bus operators share more information on fares, uh, routes, timetables and so on. Um, and the last aspect is that if an operator removes, uh, deregisters a service, um, the bill gives local authorities the power to ask that operator for information, patronage and revenue information on those services. Um, so all of these tools are, if you like, available um, to a local authority. Um, I think you're interested particularly in the rural sphere, so the last one I mentioned there might be? How they would enhance what, what is there at the moment, um, these, these references you've made, please. Yep, and I think there's quite a lot of different tools there, so I might be led by you in terms of which one you're particularly interested in. Um, what we've tried to do is improve the framework of existing options. So from the 2001 Transport Act, um, tools already exist like quality partnerships and quality contracts. Um, we've tried to improve those and go beyond them, um, but also looking at direct running of bus services. And I might ask are the particular things that you're interested in delving into. 
Well, yes, um, there's a frustration that uh, what's seen as a very good model, the Lothian bus model, mm. is um, not, as we understand, not an option. Perhaps you could explain what the legislative barrier to having a, a public operator operating on a commercial mm. basis successfully, like Lothian Bus, uh, uh, what the barriers are and yeah. why that's not addressed in this legislation, please. Yeah. I, you're right to characterise that as not being addressed by this transport bill. So Lothian Buses is the only example of um, a municipal bus company remaining in Scotland. There are a number um, down south. Um, these are companies that were um, put at arm's length from councils back in the uh, 80s. Um, and through deregulation, most of them were sold off to the private sector. But at that time, um, Lothian Buses was not sold off, so it remains owned by the, the councils there. Um, and Lothian operates uh, commercially and can compete essentially in the commercial market like another, like a first or a stagecoach. So your question is about um, the bill. Why does the legislation not facilitate other local authorities responding in a similar way? Yeah. I, I think colleagues will come on with other questions yeah. about it, as it would seem. Yeah. You're, entirely, you're entirely right. So, Peter, if you could focus in on that, because I've got Colin and Richard wanting to come in on, on that. So, yep. Peter, do you want to answer what, that specific question? Yeah. So, the reason we focused in on supported bus services is um, we had a full public consultation towards the end of last year. Um, and the issues that local authorities brought to the fore were around, particularly in rural situations, cases where they, they already have the power to support bus services, and they do that by putting them out to tender. Um, there are cases where no bids come forward, or perhaps just one bid comes forward, and they're concerned that the price is, is high. So it's a, essentially there's a monopoly situation there. Um, so that was the specific problem, if you like, that we sought to solve um, with the provisions in the legislation. But as you say, that's constrained to the supported service uh, end of things, not the commercial end. And, and then Richard, and I, if, if we don't get it back, I might bring you back in, uh, John. Uh, what the bill therefore does is continue a two-tier system whereby you have all the buses being able to continue, but no other local authority can follow that model, uh, and that will clearly act as a disincentive to local authorities to set up municipal bus companies. And I'm also keen to know, given the fact that uh, you, you have this two-tier system, a commercial bus company would be able to bid for a franchise. It would be helpful to know whether or not a local authority would be able to bid for a franchise. Yeah. Peter. Yep. Um, so the other thing I would add in is that um, SPT already, under its powers that it inherited uh, from being a, um, a passenger transport authority, essentially those powers were transferred to SPT, already has powers to run buses, and that would include in, in the commercial space. Um, they so far choose not to do so. <coughs> Sorry, did you want to come no, back? No, no, I'll just... Yeah. Um, there's also an exemption in the 1985 Act for Islands Authorities, so just to give you that information. But I think you're interested in local authorities more broadly. I, I, th I think so. I mean, r r r <coughs> at that level, Plainfield, SPT and, and the Islands, with respect, don't cover the whole of Scotland. So I live in Dumfries and Galloway. Dumfries and Galloway Council would not be able to set up a bus company under the provisions of the law to run bus services, except mm. for those services that currently make a loss. And, and that's, that's different from Lothian, so, so why is it not the whole of Scotland? Uh, and, and specifically, would, and given that example, Dumfries and Galloway Council be able to bid for a franchise within their area uh, uh, under the provision of the law that yeah. you're proposing? And I suppose w what I've tried to lay out there is our thinking behind uh, the Transport Bill as written, which focuses on supported services. It's also fair to say, though, that since the bill going public, we have had a number of discussions with stakeholders um, engagement on this bill has been going on for a number of years now, um, but most recently we've had uh, some information sessions and some one-to-one -one meetings, and it has become apparent that there's some interest out there in certain authorities and certain stakeholder groups um, for a, a Lothian model to be possible. So it's important to stress that the legislation doesn't do that as it stands, but it's something that we are certainly looking into, um, what considerations we would have to make around that sort of thing. Richard, Colin, sorry, there's three other members wanting to come in, so Richard, if I bring you in. Yeah, what a new transport 
transport bill was muted, some of us hoped that we would improve transport mm. and improve buses. I live in the SPT area. Um, sorry, it does not work for, for me or my constituents. So we are not missing a trick here. I had hoped that councils could run their own services in areas where the service is poor. We have got people out there that can't get a bus after six o'clock. We have got people out there that can't get a bus you know, in a regular time. You know, can we not be bold and, and basically allow councils, who even who are part in pay to SPT, allowing them to come out and do a loading type system? I mean, I, I'm not sure there's too much more I can say in terms of what the bill does and the rationale for where we are. In terms of if we were looking at a, the Lothian style model uh, and a commercial model, um, as I say, we have had some discussions on that. Um, we would be looking into things like uh, competition and state aid uh, considerations to make sure that, that, were, uh, that those things were safeguarded. Um, but as I say, the work, the work hasn't been done on it yet. Um, those are considerations we would have to make. The other thing in my mind is that uh, we wouldn't want to do anything that would undermine the Lothian model. So we're in recognition that Lothian run good buses. Um, the situation therein has come about through history, essentially, involving over time. Um, so we would want to be very careful not to undermine that and with any unintended consequences. Okay. I, I, I think we're, we're <coughs> at a slight impasse here because th th there seems to be some question and I think these are probably more appropriately directed at the Minister when he comes in because it is a policy. John, do you want to come back very briefly on, on, on another it's one? A, it's a very short, uh, um, the, the committee is aware in, of, from other work we've done that uh, the research shows that there's a significant decline in bus numbers and that's due to increased car use, increased bus fares and increased journey times. Mm. Is there any measures in the bill that specifically address these issues, please? Take that as well. I, Peter, if I if I might start, um, I, yeah, we're, we're very mindful of that, and I think we started at the point of looking at bus patronage, which has been declining since the 60s at least. Um, <clears throat> I think you're you're absolutely right to contrast car use and car ownership against that, um, and those are the most closely correlated things when we look at trends. Um, it's important to say that. Bus patronage is not uniform across Scotland. Um, the Scotland number is very much driven by Glasgow and Strathclyde, which has seen a, a, a more severe decline than other areas. But even in other areas, we're seeing issues with bus patronage. <coughs> There's been some work done by KPMG quite recently uh, on behalf of the Confederation of Passenger Transport, trying to tease out why that patronage decline has taken place. Um, and we have a lot of discussions around this. Congestion um, is one issue that keeps coming back to us. So the tools that we've put in place um, are, are put in place mindful of that. So, for example, the Bus Service Improvement Partnership model um, gives a framework and a set of tools for local authorities to work with <coughs> excuse me, bus operators to tackle things like congestion. Um, which get in the way of a, a good, efficient bus service for the bus user. Um, so that's one thing I would suggest that's, uh, that's in place uh, to tackle uh, bus patronage. Gonna come, okay. We're going to come back to the bus uh, service improvement partnerships. Uh, John, can I, can I move on and just ask, Jamie, you, you had a question um, which would sort of roll up this. So if you could perhaps try that and then we'll move on to Peter's question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. I'll try and uh, bunch some of this up, and I appreciate some of these questions might be for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, obviously, you said that consultation has been taking place for quite some time on this subject. Uh, do you have a, uh, an idea of how many local authorities would actually like to set up uh, or operate a bus service? Um, during the, from the consultation, we had a good view of um, what local authorities thought of all the tools. And I've got those numbers which we can happily provide to you. Um, it's also fair to say that we're at quite an early stage um, with the bill just going public. Um, local authorities are interested. They're interested in having a framework of tools. 
um, and, uh, and some of them are interested in using particular ones. Um, so we've seen from news stories, we've had individual conversations where authorities have said, yeah, I would like to run bus services directly. Um, there are other areas where there's interest, but they're not fully signed up because they haven't seen the detail of the proposals through the but, I mean, secondary just, legislation. Just in general terms, just to give the, 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 the yeah. committee an, an idea, you know, are we talking uh, you know, a handful or are we talking mm. in the dozens? Yeah. Just, just to give some context mm. as to how uh, relevant this piece of the bill will actually be in, in, in reality. Yeah. So in terms of the, the municipal um, services, um, I would say there's, there's, a, there's a handful um, who are saying, yeah, we're very interested in that. Um, since the bill has gone in and the discussion around the commercial end of direct running has come in, um, other authorities have come forward. But that's really an emerging picture, so I don't have a set number um, okay. on that aspect. Could, could I then ask, is it possible that the reason there's not been more interest mm. is the fact that the bill, perhaps as Richard Lyle said, doesn't really open up adequate opportunities for them to operate viable services. My understanding uh, on, around the policy notes of the bill is that they can only operate a service if uh, there is not an existing commercial service operating, so there's no competition in the market. That would therefore mean that they could only uh, operate in uh, what is classed as unmet public transport need routes. Again, that's quite unclear as to how you define what is an unmet public transport need. Is that a, a, an area where there is no service running, or is it an area where there's a poor service running, or an, where a commercial operator has pulled out of a service, for example, which is commonplace across many of our constituencies. So is it the case that it's just simply not going to be commercially viable for any local authority to operate an, a, a viable service? And that's perhaps why there's been less interest than we, we would have imagined. The what we're talking about, the, the ability for local authorities to run directly or via arm's length <coughs> a bus service, it relates directly to the 1985 Act powers around section 63, <coughs> excuse me, for local authorities to, as you say, to meet an unmet need. So it's something local authorities do as they meet and drink anyway. They look at their um, communities, they look at what bus services um, would be necessary to, to serve those adequately, if you like. Um, and then they'll look at, okay, which services are provided commercially already um, and where there are gaps in their determination and unmet need, um, they would look to, as I say, currently they would put it out to tender um, to the private sector. All we're trying to do is extend the power for them to run those services directly. And we have had a number of conversations through, chiefly through ATCO, the Association of Transport Coordinating Officers. Um, who very much welcome that tool and say, yeah, that's, it's really helpful, especially in cases where we're not getting any bids for our tenders. Um, we would like the ability to run it directly, and there's some frustration that they don't have that ability currently uniformly across Scotland. Uh, what I'm um, okay, Jamie, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, we're, we are running out of time, and it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting uh, problem, this. It seems strange to me that we've got to where we are in this uh, transport bill with a lot of consultation and we, and we still haven't bottomed out what authorities want to do, what seems to be uh, they're now expressing a wish to do. I can't understand why that, that hasn't come to light earlier. Um, and maybe that's a question that we can put to the Minister. Uh, I'm afraid I am going to have to move on. And, and Peter, can I ask you to do a very succinct question on, on, on the one that you've said you want to I'll do? I'll be as succinct as I possibly can. It's about bus service improvement partnerships. <laughs> Uh, the bill proposes the abolition of statutory bus quality partnerships and their replacement with BSIPs. And we're told that a local transport authority would not be allowed to proceed with a BSIP if a sufficient number of bus operators that would be affected by the proposals object to it. We're not told what a sufficient number might be, but it, it seems to me that this is just a, uh, allows bus operators a veto over any BSIP proposal. Is that not Peter, um, and, 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 and sorry, I'm just going to say a succinct question. If we could keep them sharp so I can get as many answers in and as many questions. So that was to you, Peter. And, and Peter, may, may we have your, your short answer to that, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be as quick as possible. So the BSIP model, essentially, it tries to put a framework around a negotiation. So local authorities and bus operators sitting down together 
looking at what communities need um, and what is required to deliver those things. Um, you're right to, to home in on uh, the voting mechanism, and this is something that will be set by regulation um, in terms of the detail of that. Um, but uh, a local authority will put together a, a plan for a partnership um, over a given area. Um, and as you say, the partnership can only go ahead if the bus operators agree to it. So it's very much a negotiation um, done in partnership um, where the local authority will say, uh, you know, we want good frequent bus services. They might look at maximum fares, for example, um, and have some control over that aspect. And the bus operator, uh, for their part, would want perhaps action on congestion, on parking, and on this kind of thing. Um, but it is important that both operators and the local authority both buy into uh, the partnership for it to go ahead. Mm. So did you get your answer what, well, to, I mean, to it, what sufficient number means? Well, what does you, it mean? You, would, have you any idea what a sufficient number means? And mm. it, it really, your answer really confirms what I said, that the, the bus operators, do, operators in, in, in de facto do have a, a veto over the, the whole system, because if they object to a certain number, we don't know the number object, then it doesn't go ahead. Yeah, I, it, it is fair to say that if um, a large number of operators uh, don't want to take part in the partnership, it can't go ahead, and the local authority would be expected to look at the other options that we put forward in that case. Um, in terms of sufficient number, that's not laid out in the primary legislation. Um, we've, uh, we've looked to take a regulation-making power to set that, um, mm. and that's quite, it's quite a sensitive model to try and understand there's the number of operators in the area, but there's also the market share that they have. Um, so we want to work on that with local authorities and with bus operators and make sure it's set in the right level for Scotland, um, as I say, by regulations. I fear we're not going to get that answer then until the Cabinet Secretary comes in. Richard, the next question is yours. Yeah, I'm just sitting, sitting thinking here, if, if it's a devolved matter, we can amend it, we can approve it, we can change it. You've quoted the 1985 Act. Let me throw a, another Act at you. Um, no bus quality contracts have been established since the passage of the Transport Scotland Act 2001. I think we passed that one. Why do you think the local service franchising proposals in the bill will meet more with success than the quality contract provision of the 2001 Act? We've, again, we've had uh, a number of conversations with local authorities, RTPs and others, um, to try and improve what was laid out as the quality contracts, as you say, in the 2001 legislation. Um, one of the things we consulted on, which had a great deal of support, was removing the entry bar to quality contracts, or to franchising, as we're calling the new thing. Um, Previously, the formulation was that they had to be necessary to implement the relevant general policies, and that was seen as too high a bar, even uh, for the thing to be attempted. So we've worked with local authorities um, around the entry point, um, and we've lowered that bar, essentially, for the local authority to enter into an assessment for a franchise. But it's fair to say we have kept other uh, checks and balances because it's such a large intervention in the market. Um, but we've had quite a lot of positive comments about the, the, the franchising offer that we put forward. A very short one, and then I'd like to but move on to Maureen. You, you said franchise, but you can only do a franchise if you're going to do the whole thing, but you're basically saying that councils can't. If people object, or people are running it themselves, you know, privately, or, or it's out to a bus company. So where is the change for councils? I don't see any. Yeah. So I think what, what I need to explain more clearly is uh, the different options that we have here. Previously, talking about partnership, yes, very much the, the operators have to agree to that. In the case of a franchise, um, that's more something that the local authority, yes, has to do a business case um, and has to prove that they've looked into all of the considerations around that. But the, the bus operators don't have to agree to it. Um, it's a power for the local authorities to go ahead uh, in a different direction if they wish to go down that route. I suspect, Richard, when the Cabinet Secretary comes in, you will be grilling him, and I suspect that Peter will you be rely, uh, relaying to him the, uh, the pressure he's been put under here. Maureen, the next I question... I apologise to Mr Grant if he feels any pressure. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think he dealt with it very well, and, and I, I noticed Gordon looking nervous because he'll be the next one up. Maureen. Yeah, um... 
I'd like to ask about smart ticketing um, and the purpose of the smart ticketing proposals in the bill. Given that the Scottish Government already sets smart ticketing technical standards and processes for most public transport through the National Concessionary Fare Scheme and Rail Franchise Contract, so what's the, what's the purpose of these smart ticketing proposals in the, in the bill? Gordon, that thing is you. I think you actually summarised it very well there, and what we want to do is to build on what we've already got in the concessionary travel scheme and the rail franchise. We, we basically want to encourage and enable a, a national infrastructure, a common platform that will make it easier to introduce smart ticketing and smart ticketing products in a consistent way across the whole of Scotland, regardless of whether it's the concessionary travel scheme or some other part of the public transport network. But the proposals in the bill, as far as I can see, rely on local authorities making uh, smart ticketing schemes. You know, if we compare it with other countries like the Netherlands, for example, we've got a, a national integrated smart card schemes. I mean, I think, you know, we've been talking about smart ticketing and smart cards and everything for decades and nothing seems to be happening. And one of my worries is that now people just swipe their card you know, let's say in London transport, and you don't really know if you're getting the best deal on your tickets or not. Um, and there's, there's little or no crossover still in terms of, you know, using the, the tram, for example, and, and the bus, whereas in other countries you can go and use your ticket on all modes of transport. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a slight difference. There's, there's the the ticketing system, the infrastructure that underpins it, and that's very much what this piece of legislation focuses on. The, the ticketing products, which are really fares that might exist in paper today or in smart card today, are still largely a matter for operators. Mm -hmm. So how is this bill going to make things different and better for the passenger? We believe we'll be creating that or encouraging the creation of that common platform. And that's what you see in any country in Europe, a consistent infrastructure for ticketing to operate on. It should make it a lot easier for operators to collaborate on providing the kinds of tickets and fare system that you've just described, and also for local authorities where there's a need and a demand to create that, that multi-operator um, provision in a local area. But as I go back to my point, we've been talking about it for years and the op operators haven't really done anything. They haven't collaborated to make it better and easier for the passenger to use public transport. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. They haven't done, they've done a lot of stuff. They haven't maybe done it as quickly as we would like to see. And I think that's precisely why we want to put in place the provisions in, in this, 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 this proposed legislation to try to inject a bit more pace into what's already happening. So we want to encourage and enable the provision of a national infrastructure, a common one, because without that you, you always struggle to provide something that's consistent for passengers across the whole of Scotland. We want to create a, a, a national advisory board um, to, to ministers where operators themselves and local authorities and passenger represent representatives can come together and say, yes, this is the right way to develop, use, advise on prevailing technology, again, with a, a view to making all this easier. And we want to clarify uh, the powers available to local authorities to set up local uh, multi-operator schemes and arrangements in their areas. I'd like to bring in Colin, if I may, on, yeah. on that. And then, and then th there's time for one more question. So, and Jamie's caught my eye. So, Colin, if you'd like to come in. I'm just seeking some clarity. In 2012, the government announced they were introducing a, a saltire card, a single uh, national multi-model smart card. But what you're saying is that actually what you're doing now is just enabling the industry to do something. So is the, smart, is the saltire card now effectively binned? No. I mean, the, the card is there. The card has been actually there for years. Um, what we want to do, I think, is to make it progressively easier 
for all, I mean, there's 200 bus operators in Scotland, there are 13 ferry operators, there's a tram operator, there's a subway operator, uh, there's, there's, there's actually five rail operators in Scotland, and what we are trying to do is to encourage and make it easier for them to operate on a, a common platform. It doesn't mean we force them all to use a Saltire card. So some operators have chosen to develop their own version of the card. But what we are seeking to do, and in fact we've had a lot of success already, is to make all these cards, however they're branded, operate in exactly the same way. So there will be a good excuse for Stuart Stevenson to bring out the six or seven cards he brings out <laughs> at every committee meeting to say that he has to use them all. Jamie, last question, and, and, and then we're, um, we're going to have to move on to the next uh, I think that, that last answer really highlights the problem. There are multiple operators all running differential schemes with no standardisation on technology. It's a very confusing picture from a consumer's point of view. There are multiple cards you can get. Some people have no idea which card does what or which mode of transport or which part of Scotland you can use it in. The pricing models are different across uh, every operator. Surely this transport bill, from a policy point of view, was an amazing opportunity to do something about that and create some standardisation from the top down, a, a government-led policy that takes initiative and puts an end to this hugely complex and fra fragmented uh, marketplace for the consumer. Why did it not do that? I, I think we are trying to encourage and enable that common platform. But you're setting up an advisory board and you're na enabling national standards. That's not, to me, taking the lead in, in solving the, the, this problem. Okay. I mean, we, I think we expect it to be the operators who will pay the cost of providing that infrastructure in the same way that, as they would put tyres on their buses, for example. So we felt it was important that the operators had a say in the technology and the migration, but technology develops very, very fast. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's both about operators, if you like, agreeing um, when to introduce maybe a new type of technology and what the migration path should be towards that new technology and to advise the minister on their thoughts on, on all that. So we are trying to encourage and enable that national platform within this legislation. Gordon, thank you very much. I, I fear, again, this is something that the uh, Cabinet Secretary will be pushed harder on when, when he comes in. So I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting now to allow officials to change over. I'd ask members of the committee to stay in their seats. The meeting is suspended. Thank you. I'd like to reconvene the meeting and continue the evidence session on the Transport Bill. We're now going to look at low emission zones and parking. Um, Tasha Getty, you are staying in place, uh, but we'd like to welcome uh, Stephen Thompson, who is Head of Environmental and Sustainability Policy, George Henry, who is the Policy Manager for Parking, uh, Anne Kens and Claire McGill, who are both solicitors. Welcome. And the first... Uh, <coughs> Question, if I get myself to the right place, I think it's from Peter. Peter. Thank you, convener. We're on LEZs uh, now, folks. I mean, as I understand it, there are two ways to operate an LEZ. You can either take the form of a ban on certain classes of vehicle, and uh, if they do come in, there's a penalty imposed for non-compliance, or there may be a charge to enter the LEZ if the entry criteria are not met. Then this is the system that they have in London. So why, can, why has the Scottish Government chosen the first option? Who's going to lead? Stephen, you're off on that. OK. Yeah, we, we asked in the consultation back in November whether the penalty 
option or the charge option would be favoured. The, the, the penalty option actually was slightly more favourable than the, the charge option. So that's the, the, the first drivers that stakeholders were, were asking for that. Uh, Scottish ministers have also had a long-standing policy on road pricing, which effectively is what a charge would be. So their powers do exist for road pricing, but at, at this point in time, the Scottish minister's view on road pricing was that they were not in favour. So that's why the uh, secondly, why the route went down uh, for a ban. There's a third option in there as well, which is essentially a ban as a form of access restriction. So it prevents the, the dirtiest vehicles entering a space, whereas a charge would allow those dirty vehicles to enter the space if a person was willing to pay a, a, a fee. Mm. So there was, a, there was a fairness and equity element in that in, in terms of going down the, the, the ban route. OK, I understand that. I mean, your, your last bit of the, uh, your answer there leads me on to the next question. You, you know, the, the effectiveness of an LEZ is dependent on the scheme design. So, and Scottish ministers will set out the emission standards, exempt vehicles and penalty charges and regulations rather than in the bill. But can you provide any indication at this point of what might be in these regulations and, you know, with some more detail of how it's going to operate? Yeah. Um, we. We, we've outlined a, a series of proposals in the consultation. Uh, the, we felt that the parity with other similar LEZ schemes uh, across Europe, for example, in emission standards, going towards a, a Euro 6 standard for diesel, a Euro 4 standard for petrol, would provide a, a basis for the Scottish LEZs to be uh, amongst the most ambitious in Europe. Uh, like you say, we've got a series of regulation-making powers on things like penalties, Mm. Uh, and exemptions. Uh, to give you an example of, of exemptions, we, we listed a number again in the consultation so th topics like blue badge holders or, or, or derivative of blue badge, uh, blue lights. Uh, we talked perhaps about uh, vehicles that are essential services like uh, road gritters or road sweepers or so on. Uh, there's been other uh, topics that have come up in, in discussion with uh, businesses that operate funeral services or wedding cars. So mm -hmm. those are the types of topics that we would want to explore in the regulations for, for exemptions, for example. Have you, any, have you any thoughts on what the penalty charges are likely to be? We, we've had thoughts. Uh, <laughs> the, I think we, we, the, 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 the top end of the charge was set uh, by, by uh, guidance from Anne uh, in relation to what the maximum fine could be. We've included uh, an option within the, the bill that there can be an escalation or surcharges of the bill, so of the penalty, sorry, so that the penalty might start at a relatively low level, perhaps akin to uh, a speeding fine, but can escalate depending on the number of offences. So that, again, is where we would want to take a regulation-making power, but we, we've tried to, to follow where existing legislation is, is already in place, and, and you, might, you might want to... Uh, give examples here, but a speeding fine as a starting point, an entry point into the, the, the penalty charge might be a, a reasonable place to begin, but then perhaps have an escalation uh, thereafter. I just want to highlight a bit, say a bit more on, on what that is, because there are different levels of speeding fine. Um, I, I believe this, this, the standard speeding fine would be around £60, but I don't think we've, we've created any kind of conclusions about um, what the actual fine will be. I, th I think it's very much going to be a process of um, taking the evidence um, as, as the bill goes through and then uh, ministers will make a final decision and the regulation will set the, um, the actual amount in due course. Peter? It seems, uh, I mean, if you're saying that if you come into an LEZ with a vehicle that shouldn't be in an LEZ once and it's going to be 60 quid, that seems very, very harsh to me. But, you know, that's just my comment. Uh, there, are, there haven't been any final conclusions taken on that. Um, it's, it's still a process that, that's uh, being worked out, but it, the amount will be set in the regulations. When, you, when do you think that some of these details might be, be forthcoming? Have you got some kind of timescale to give the committee an idea about some of these details? Because I think it's very important that we know some, some of this. Yeah. Uh, well, to, to give you a, a flavour of where we're at, we we're starting to, right now to, to develop the, the outline of what regulations will look like. Uh, we don't want to be in a place where the, the, the bill goes through its due process, uh, receives a royal assent, and then only then does the regulation start being developed. Yeah. That's not what the local authorities want. It's not what we want. No. So uh, 
in terms of a rough indication of time scale, probably between now and Christmas to develop the outline of the, the, the regulations, uh, and then uh, after Christmas, between Christmas and summer, to, to finalise what, what they would look like in tandem with what the, the, the parliamentary process uh, identifies. Jamie. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Camilla. Good morning to the new panel members. <clears throat> um, I think there's a tremendous amount of goodwill uh, around the committee and probably around the parliament for the intentions of an LEZ. Um, however, there's also a huge amount of concern outside of the walls of this building, uh, particularly amongst drivers, uh, people who reside within LE potential LEZs, and also around uh, businesses who operate within LEZs, around the possibility that there may be um, differential schemes operating, different criteria, different grace periods, different exemptions uh, on a city-by-city -city basis. Do you recognise some of these concerns and what are you doing to address them? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a valid point, that the, the, the schemes in some instances could be different. Uh, we've, we've listened to what local authorities have asked for and they, they essentially asked for two things uh, which seem to be diametrically opposed. One, they asked for consistency in terms of emission standards, uh, penalties, uh, exemption lists, but they also asked for the powers to create their own LEZ based on either the size or the scope or the timing, uh, which, is, which is fair enough because the local authorities are, are best placed to understand the air quality challenges that they have. Uh, I think the, the, the point that you make is, is well made in terms of communicating to, to members of the public what the differences are. So if, for example, uh, we know Glasgow are looking at a suite of vehicles within their LEZ, but if another city decides to include, for example, buses and only private cars, we have to communicate to, to members of the public uh, and businesses that, for example, HGVs or light good vehicles are not included. And that's where the work ha has to happen the, during the grace periods to let those businesses and, and individuals know what the, the differences are. OK, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that the, the flexibility uh, for the zones to determine, for example, geographic areas of the zones, which streets are not included, or the time of day, depending on the needs and, and yeah. uh, of that city. However, um, surely a scheme that means you can drive in one city but not in another will cause tremendous amounts of confusion for, for, for businesses and, and commuters. Uh, can you also uh, clarify if there were, it is likely there would be exemptions for residents, and by that I mean private car operators? The London scheme, for example, uh, does offer a fairly substantial discount scheme uh, on the opt-in uh, version of, of a such a zone. Um, and do you think it's right that people who reside within LEZs should be penalised for driving the cars to and from their place of home simply because of where they live? Yeah, I think that point about residents living in LEZ was, was uh, identified during the consultation uh, exercise. Uh, that's the reason why we've included an additional grace period uh, in the bill. So the grace period on the face of it is for all vehicles. Uh, uh, and then there's an additional grace period for residents who live within an, an LEZ, so have an additional uh, period of time to adapt. But a grace period has a, an end stop, so it, it's, it's a temporary exemption, not a permanent exemption. Why, why a grace period and not a plan to provide permanent exemption for residents? Well, the, the grace period is, is working in tandem with how the fleet looks just now versus how the fleet might look at the end of the grace period if, if the maximum grace period is taken. So the fleet is naturally going to evolve uh, anyway towards uh, a Euro 6 standard and away from the, the older vehicles. But you're right, there will be some residents who, even at the end of that grace period, an extended grace period, will still have vehicles that are non-compliant. So the, the, there will be people that will will have to adapt uh, as part of the LEZ. When you say place. adapt, what you're talking about here, just you know, for the benefit of members of the public watching this, is you're saying that people who perhaps are, are, are stuck with older vehicles, um, perhaps people who cannot afford modern newer vehicles uh, and rely on their vehicle, um, will in effect be faced with a daily fine to commute or travel around their own cities. Is, is that the potential scenario? That, that is one scenario, yes. Thank you. OK, uh, we'll move on to uh, the next section. John. Yes, on uh, parking and uh, specifically on parking and pavements uh, or footpaths or footways or however we describe them. I mean, if, if I take my constituency, I've got up quite a lot of streets where the road's quite narrow, the pavements are reasonably wide, and it makes sense to put two wheels on the pavement. 
and the police come to community meetings and they say to residents, you should put two wheels on the pavement. That makes sense. It keeps the roads flowing. It keeps the pavements clear. So can you explain to me why we're going down this road of a blanket ban and then the councils would have to exempt certain roads rather than just saying where there is a problem, the council would have the power to ban pavement parking? George, I think that's going to come to you. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, when we've discussed this um, through our public consultation and with stakeholders, it was felt that a national ban would be um, the best approach um, because the bill um, requires local authorities to undertake assessments of the roads to determine which roads um, should be exempt for the ones that you've described. Um, these will be set out in the ministerial direction and collated in our parking standards document, which will identify which streets um, can be available for exemption. Um, and that would ensure that there is a consistency in assessment and implementation um, across, the, uh, across the parking elements of this bill. Um, the process of exempting streets will be set out in regulations that are made under section 44 of this bill. I just wonder if it wouldn't have been easier for a council, though, to, to list the streets where parking is not allowed in the pavement. Would it not be more onerous in the councils to list the streets where it is allowed in the pavements? Um, the, from our discussions with, with local authorities, um, it was certainly felt that because the number of streets um, that probably will be exempt will be lower um, than, than you know, where the actual problems are, where everyone is parking um, on, on pavements where um, they don't want it to exist, it's, it's deemed an easier approach for local authorities because they will promote exemptions on a smaller number of streets than it would be the other way around. And, and can you tell me in a slightly different angle, I mean, there already is a ban on driving on pavements, and yes. I've always wondered this myself, because clearly if you put two wheels on the pavement, you are driving on the pavement. It, it, so is that not already banned? Um, no, it's not, it's not illegal to, to actually park on a footway as it stands. It's illegal to drive on one. Now, now granted, you have to drive on one to get your car there. Um, but, but certainly, um, that is why um, you know, it's created um, a, an issue with people parking on footways. It causes um, great difficulties for some road users um, and vulnerable road users. Um, but that is why we're seeking to um, iron that problem out and make it clear that it's illegal to park in a footway. OK, and then moving on to the question of enforcement, a, the, I understand that in some areas it would be the council that would enforce. Am I right in saying that in some areas it would be the police that would enforce? In, in both cases, do they have to enforce? I mean, would there be any penalty on a council that frankly just ignores this and allows the parking and pavements? Or would, would there be some onus on the council? Would there be some force on the council or the police to actually enforce? Um, this, this bill um, confers the powers to for all 32 local authorities to enforce the new restrictions <coughs> on, on pavement um, and double parking. Um, it will be up to the local authority to identify how it wishes to carry out that enforcement. Um, but we, there is a commitment to an annual report, uh, which we will be putting before the Scottish Parliament, um, to identify you know, the, the successes of the, the bill or otherwise, and identify which local authorities um, are carrying out their duties appropriately. Um, I'm going to bring Richard in briefly, and if I've got time, John, I'll come back to you. Yeah. In my constituency, I have pavements where they're quite large, uh, in both sides, some streets are, are, are quite big. Some, and I agree with John, some streets are quite narrow, and it's going to be a problem in some areas with, with what I call cul-de-sacs, yep. where the, you, know, you can only drive into the, the thing mean, and you're hitting the hammerhead, you know, and all the way back out is to reverse or whatever. Um, but the question I want to ask you, do councils have to consult the garden exemptions uh, on, on a pavement? Uh, can the council amend this as it's ongoing, you know, uh, over the years? Uh, and can the public contact? Is there going to be a, a system where the, the public, say, a, a street can contact or, or petition the council to amend and allow them to to pavement park? I welcome this bill. I, I think it will be good for 
people who are in wheelchairs and, and especially the, the uh, young families uh, and people with prams. You know, I abhor people parking on the pavement, but sadly, as John says, there are occasions where you just can't go anywhere else. Yeah, the, well, local authorities will, will undertake their assessments as, as part of, obviously, the provisions within the bill, um, and they will be required um, that when identifying streets that can be exempt, that they will come uh, be identified through our parking standards document. Um, as I'd said earlier, Section 44 um, will confer on ministers the powers to set out regulations um, through the process of um, exemptions. We are discussing that with um, local authorities that are parking st uh, stakeholder working groups at the moment. Um, and, and we do realise that there will be um, historic streets which there are um, may necessarily not might lie within the criteria as well, and we will need to consider those as we go through that process. So I think that what we're trying to do is, is get, um, you know, fix irresponsible parking first and foremost, but to really, um, you know, work with local authorities because they know their streets at best and, and so that we can get the best model to, to fix the problem, um, support the policy, but also um, assist in, in parking provisions. Uh, for local authorities. Okay. George, can I just ask you a question? Is is in the background reading that I was doing, which uh, document Roads for All Good Practice Guides for Roads, published in July 2013 by Transport Scotland, which I'm sure you know your way around. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it, it lists footway widths and it talks about uh, ramps and, and uh, blistering to allow people to, to identify where there's crossover points. Is this whole document going to have to be rewritten in light of areas where there is going to be allowed on-street parking to allow uh, people to move from one side of the road to the other in the situation where Richard was mentioning that it might be a requirement for people to park on, on pavements? Um, that document won't need to be re rewritten, no. Um, what we are doing is um, working on our parking standards document with... Um, a range of stakeholders, including local authorities, COSLA, um, Living Streets, etc. We are working um, in partnership with those to um, discuss the footway widths where you know we can allow footway parking on. Um, and it would very much, the early discussions are that it would support the Roads for All uh, guidance. So, say, for example, around about two metres. Um, would, is the sort of uh, narrowest footway that we would uh, that we need that would allow two wheel uh, wheel two wheelchairs to pass a double buggy etc. Um, so therefore, um, as we develop this this parking standards document um, with our stakeholders, we'll, we'll very much take cognizance of that document um, and, and work through it. And understanding, so just so I understand this, is is that if you've got a two metre width walkway on one side. You, of the road, you might need not need a two metre walkway width on the other side, but good practice dictates that it shouldn't be less than 1.5, and, and it doesn't stipulate whether that, that it's on both sides of the road or one side of the road. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, what, what we would look at um, and working with local authorities and when they are doing their assessments, they, they are obviously best placed to assess their streets and, and know what is best um, for that area. Um, you know, it may be a case that they could allow, um, you know, a narrower footway on one side, um, providing the crossing points um, are, are remain free and that people can pass from one side of the street to the other in a safe as possible manner. Thank you, George. Maureen, did you want to come in briefly and then Just I want to move to my... Point. Um, can you tell me why the bill doesn't propose a ban on parking in front of dropped kerbs? Um, you know, that's an issue particularly important to people who have mobility impairments. Yeah, it certainly is a problem, um, and we're currently discussing with stakeholders um, what drop curbs um, could be in scope to be included. Um, when we're doing that, we will identify um, if we can take these forward under secondary legislation, and that is currently the plan. So there will be, um, you know, discussions have taken place. So known crossing points, so where there's tactile paving for visually impaired, etc. Um, there will be um, a national ban there as well, but we're looking to take that forward under secondary legislation. So is there a difference? You need to distinguish between a difference where there's a drop curb to allow somebody to get their car into the front of their house mm -hmm. compared to a narrower bit where people can, uh, with wheelchairs or buggies can cross? 
Yeah, it's identifying um, the difference between what is a crossing point or, or a domestic driveway. Um, you know, one of the big things that we have considered with stakeholders as we've worked through this policy is displacement of vehicles and, and what impact that will have. Say, for instance, if you know we have many uh, many housing estates or many streets where you have a one vehicle driveway, but there's maybe a two or three car family. So, um, you know, the, there could be the opportunity that they can still park in front of the, their driveway. Um, but as long as the crossing points and non-crossing points for, um, you know, wheelchair users or visually impaired are, are still free, then there is still a safe um, mechanism for them to cross the street. Mike, yours is the next question. Uh, th thank you, Um We're all interested in effective legislation and certainly not ineffective legislation. And I refer to section 47, subsection 6 of the bill. Um, to me, this section, as it's written, could drive a coach and horses through the purposes of the bill as far as parking on um, paths. It says the parking prohibition, prohibitions do not apply where the motor vehicle is in the course of business being used for the purpose of delivering goods to or collecting goods from any premises or being loaded from or unloaded to any premises and the vehicle is so parked for no longer than is necessary for the delivery, collection, loading or unloading and in any event for no more than a continuous period of 20 minutes. Now, I can see this as a coach and horses. Where you put no more than 20 minutes will become a standard practice. In other words, if someone's trying to enforce this, I can see the result. Oh, I'm allowed to do here for 20 minutes. And what then happens? Another vehicle arrives for unloading or collecting goods. Oh, I can stay for 20 minutes. And whereas the law at the moment says a vehicle that is doing this has to be uh, accompanied by the driver or passenger, or somebody in that vehicle, they can wander off. And I'm very concerned for vulnerable users of our footpaths, whether they're disabled or mums or dads with prams or whatever, that the road, the, the path is then blocked. And we're welcoming a, a whole bill to make sure that people don't park and have this, people can have this free access. And this, to me, section 47, drives the coach and horses through the whole thing. If it just stopped section C, which said loading and unloading, and then removed and in any event for more than a period of 20 minutes, that would be helpful. But the way this is written is a coach and horses. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that, Jamie. If the government doesn't amend it, I certainly will try. Uh, Come back on that. Yes, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, the, um, it's something that we've been discussing um, with stakeholders um, since obviously the bill has been published. Um, the, you're right to point out, a delivery vehicle um, may park on a footway um, during its course of business whilst loading and unloading um, if it cannot reasonably do be done without um, parking on a footway. So, therefore, just to kind of to clarify that, that they should seek to find a parking space or a loading bay, um, first and foremost, and only and if only then that they cannot find one, um, can they park on the footway. But parking on a footway doesn't necessarily mean that they should be causing an obstruction, because automatically that um, there is law at the moment is that you, you shouldn't be you know causing an obstruction. So therefore, we are looking um, to to obviously identify exactly within the parking standards document what should be accepted um, or otherwise. But we are not promoting anybody blocking a footway for any vulnerable road user um, going around um, their duty. It's trying to strike the balance between um, you know, keeping the pavements and footways and roads safe as possible, but also allowing businesses to operate um, you know, and keep the economy going, etc. But we, um, have, we have the same interests. Everybody's agreement with what you've just said. That's, that's, that's the aim. The point I am making is our job is to look at legislation that you present to us. Yeah and look at the problems with it and see, and I've identified this as a really big problem because th th this gives the opportunity. It's all very well for what you're saying, but in defense, a lawyer will just turn around and say, but the bill says I'm allowed to stay here for 20 minutes. And it doesn't say, I have got to ha it doesn't say I've got to allow a gap for allow somebody through. It says I can do this, unloading and unloading for 20 minutes. And in fact, the next guy can do the same thing. 
this, if, if what we're trying to do is to achieve the objective, this needs to be rewritten. There is, there is already um, primary legislation in place that uh, doesn't allow people to cause an obstruction. Um, so therefore, um, you know, that can be picked up in, in current legislation. Um, that, this bill actually looks at provisions under obstruction and all the other irresponsible parking yes, but this um, is defense. methods that this, happen. This is against prosecution, this is a legal defence. And if I were looking at this, I'd be saying, my goodness, I'm not going to be prosecuted about this because it's clearly in the legislation, the law that we're going to be passed, going to allow us to do it. With George, you can come out. I mean, I mean, I mean I, I, I'm going to make the observation that we, we as a committee will get the chance to uh, question our other witnesses when they come in on this very subject, because I think the, the point that Mike makes, everyone ran in the committee probably has some sympathy with it in the sense that, you know, if it's 20 minutes and you sit there in your lorry, if you move it forward 1.5 metres, does that mean you're in a different parking space and, and therefore you know, you, you're not causing an obstruction and therefore the 20 minutes starts again? I think there are all sorts of valid questions here. George, it'd be interesting for you just to give a small answer and for us perhaps, Mike, to, to quiz uh, more people on this as the evidence session takes place. Well, I mean, yes, we are. Uh, thanks, Convener. We are discussing this continually with um, stakeholders uh, as part of the Parking Standards uh, Working Group. However, um, to, to just be clear, they do need to try and find a car parking space um, or a loading bay to, to carry out that duty first and foremost. And it will be down to the enforcement officers to, you know, um, efficiently enforce this to ensure um, that there is no disrepute um, being taken forward. And then just to reiterate again, there is other legislation in place currently as it stands that they shouldn't be causing an obstruction. Uh, 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 I'm sure, with, with, in fairness, where there are lots of parking enforcement officers, that would be easy to do, but in, in more remote places, it may be difficult. Richard, come in, if you may, and then we're going to have to move George, on to the next one. A, a quick question. Does this bill also apply to car parks? where we often go into a car park and somebody's stupidly, but they've paid their entrance fee or whatever, is parking on a pavement. It's not a designated um, uh, space. I know you may say, well, it's up to the company that owns that car park to do something about it, but does this bill cover that? Um, no, this bill only covers on street, on street um, park. parking. Thank you. Um, Thank you for Thank clarifying you. that. I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses. So. Okay, I'm now going to reconvene the meeting and we're going to move on to the third session this morning on the Transport Bill and we're going to look at roadworks, canals, uh, regional transport partnerships. Tasha, you, you have sat uh, through all three sessions, so I'm not going to welcome you again. Kat Quay, uh, there, thank you. Policy Officer, Roadworks. Joanne Gray, Policy Manager, Regional Transport Partnerships. Chris Wilcox, the Head of Ports, Shipping, Freight and Canals, Kevin Gibson and Claire McGill, both solicitors. Um, so, the first question, uh, let me move to that section of it, is uh, Colin. Colin. Thank you very much, Convener. Can, can I start by asking a question on, on the issue of roadworks? Um, and specifically, what circumstances would you anticipate the Scottish Roadworks Commission are using the proposed inspection powers within the bill? Cap. Yeah, um, the, the specific uh, context that the Commissioner would use these inspection powers in. At the moment, roads authorities can do an inspection regime against undertakers. Uh, the Commissioner obviously has to look at both sectors, 
the roads authorities and also the utilities. So he can look at either one. He can do information gathering. He can do specific site inspections. At the moment, he does have a, a limited range of compliance powers. He can issue fines, um, but he, needs to, he doesn't actually have any powers at the moment to be able to address things on site as they arise or if there's a specific issue that happens that needs a, a quick resolution. So it would be in the context of that. Just following that up, how do you anticipate the compliant the compliance notice regime um, actually working in practice, given the, the, the limited resources the Commissioner has and the limited existing powers? Well, the, there would have to be uh, a look at, well, there was a, a review of the office of the, and the functions of the Commissioner's office by Transport Scotland that was done uh, in 2016 that identified that he had this limitation, that he didn't have these powers to directly go and find evidence himself. Um, and that identified that there would possibly have to be an expansion of the office to cover an inspection function. So it wouldn't necessarily be the, inspect the commissioner himself going out and doing these inspections. He would need inspectors that would act for him. Okay. And can I just ask specifically, how does the bill improve, if you look at roadworks, improve um, circumstances for, for disabled people uh, when roadworks have been carried out? Is there any provisions within the bill that actually makes improvements here? And, and also, just specifically on the, the, the safety at, st uh, at street works and roadworks code of practice, Am I right in saying this is legally binding in, in the rest of the UK, but it's, it's purely sort of a code of practice in Scotland? Why is that the case? Why is it not enforceable? Uh, well, why is it not legally binding in Scotland, but it is in the rest of the UK? And should that have been tackled in the bill? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. The, the safety stewards, the code of practice is, for every other part of the UK, is legally binding for road authorities, highway authorities, undertakers. In Scotland, it only applies to the undertakers. Um, the, the history to why that is, I'm not entirely sure. Perhaps uh, Kevin could answer. It's before my time. Um, but one of the things that the bill does do is it puts that on a statutory footing for road authorities as well. Uh, there's also uh, changes to the number of qualified operatives that you need on a site um, and the type of qualifications you would need, uh, the, the street works card, as we call it. Does any... Do, sorry, you, you, you looked for help on that, um, and, and Kevin almost looked away, but do you want to add something to it? <laughs> I, I can't speak to the history of why the code is binding in England and Wales and not here. Um, what I can say is that uh, evidence of compliance with the code in Scotland is evidence that you've complied with the duties, and so the converse is, is to some extent the case. Evidence that you haven't complied with the code is evidence that you haven't complied with the duties. So it, it's, it, it has an element of a legal effect here, but it's not, it's not uh, completely binding as it is in England and Wales. Comment. Was there a reason why we didn't therefore make it binding as part of the of the transport bill? Oh, sorry. The uh, well, the, the the provisions in the current bill are to make the the red book, as we call it, the safety code, uh, mandatory for road authorities. Uh, I mean, the original safety code uh, was endorsed by the Scottish Executive. It's a very old document. Um, so I don't know why that didn't happen at the time, but, but currently the, the provisions in the bill as it stands is to make that applicable to roads authorities. And then the HSC enforce it in that way as well. Okay. That's the standard they look to. Okay. Um, John, I think the next one is here. Um, on regional transport partnership finance, um, I understand that uh, rather than the actual expenses uh, being shared around the constituent councils, it will be estimated uh, costs in future, uh, and that presumably would mean that um, if there's uh, expenses were slightly lower, there would be a fund left over, and the partnership could carry that forward. What happens if there's a, um, a deficit, and would it carry the deficit forward, or would that be dealt with in some different way? Um, Joanne, sorry. At the moment, the bill doesn't provide for a deficit, um, and at present, the, the RTPs do not carry a deficit. Um, they're required to have a zero balance at the end of fin each financial year. So, while in practice that seems quite difficult, um, what normally would happen is any excess funds would be transferred to one of the constituent councils of a, a partnership, and um, uh, in the, at the start of the following financial year, that would come back to the, the partnership. So they're effectively le lent to the, the council at the moment, or that's the future plan? No, at the moment, the funds transfer to a particular council in, in an RTP, and it then comes, comes back. I don't know if it's a loan. I, 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 okay, I wouldn't like it, to call it's, it a it's not that the money is handed back, in Strathclyde's case, to whatever it is, nine local authorities, and then we start again the new year fresh. If, if, 
I'm well, A, I'm trying to clarify the difference between wh what's going to happen now that didn't happen in the past. But as I understand it, the aim is to allow them to carry forward yes. excess funds. It's just to make it a little less clumsy than it is just now. It's right. just to create that extra flexibility so that there is no transfer of funds. It will um, it'll just be that the, the, the funds will sit where they are. They carry it forward, OK. And now, presumably, it is possible they could have a deficit because they have to overspend on the subway or something. Um, in that case, would they then, by 31st March, have to get more money from the councils, or could they carry that deficit forward and hopefully make it up the following year? Um, up until now, they haven't carried a deficit. Um, we wouldn't envisage that, um, going forward, that they would carry a deficit. Um, according to my local government finance colleagues, it's not good practice to carry a deficit. So it, it hasn't happened, happened up until now, so I can't answer that question. Thank you. OK. Um, Jamie, you, you had a question on this. Do you think that's sufficiently answered it? Partially. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I could just follow on from Mr Mason's line of questioning uh, around carrying over funds. I, I believe that the legislation will now enable uh, regional transport partnerships to uh, borrow money and, by default, uh, I suspect, accumulate um, debt as a result of the borrowing. Um, is, given some of the other elements of the bill which allow for uh, uh, greater opportunity, for example, to set up bus franchises and, and other types of public services, um, is there any worry that, given RTPs the ability to borrow funds on, on, on the, the wider market, uh, in effect, given that they're funded by local authorities, what you're creating is an opportunity for local, authority, local authorities to uh, accumulate debts to uh, fund uh, infrastructure or, or subsidise public transport? And what's the policy rationale behind this, perhaps? Um, sorry. The RTPs have actually had borrowing power since the 2005 Act. Uh, what we're doing in this Act is provide, m making more responsibility on the RTPs to comply with regulations that came in in 2016. Um, so we, RTPs, um, up until now, we aren't aware that there has been a problem with that. Um, RTPs are required by a swathe of local government finance reg regulation to ensure that they can afford whatever they borrow. And ultimately, they're, just, they're accountable to their board, um, to their constituent councils and Audit Scotland. OK. Uh, and just to briefly, are there any additional duties uh, in terms of how RTPs will be structured, monitored, managed in future? Or is this just, uh, in effect, legislation which just tinker around the, the financials as opposed to the structures of RTPs? And is there any point, was there any discussion around whether this bill could look at the wider issue of the success or lack of, of, of RTPs? No, we have, this bill isn't looking at that. It is just really is a technical amendment to allow that flexibility for the... Um, there are other pieces of work ongoing at the moment. For example, the National Transport Strategy Review, which is looking at such issues on the future of um, transport governance in Scotland. Thank you. OK, we're now going to move on to the next question, which Mike is itching to ask. Mike. Well, well I am because I want to ask about canals. Um, and they may be at the end of this session, but they're really important. I mean, I'm well aware of the work that's been done on canals um, running into the city here in Edinburgh, the canal festivals, and they're really regenerative of whole areas. And it's a very positive thing that's been happening. But recently, there have been problems when the canals have been blocked. And um, in the bill, we, we've got a section really tinkering. We're lo looking at changing the numbers on the board have you, are there any concerns the government has that, about um, the backlog of maintenance? And, and, and what about a duty placed on the board to make sure our canals are navigable um, and, and kept open? Because this would be an opportunity to do this. Chris. Hi there. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's worth saying, uh, in, in relation to what's in the bill itself, it's, it's really a technical point to give ministers the flexibility, <coughs> excuse me, to alter the structure of the board uh, in the future if they chose to do so. Uh, so at the moment, when the, when the board was set up, there were, it was restricted to six, um, mainly to kind of take the, 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 the organisation forward following separation in 2012. 
some discussions we've had just now around some of the complexities and the opportunities facing the canals have suggested that we might want to look at how we vary and, and give flexibility to bring in additional expertise or indeed to uh, reflect some of the expertise uh, from the executive team that might be there. And, and that's what we would take forward. So that's very much what we're looking to do in, in the bill. In relation to the other the things you mentioned, there is already legislation out there and uh, in terms of the 62 Act and the 68 Act that do set out how canals are supposed to operate, that do uh, have provisions within them as to um, what Scottish canals are supposed to, to do uh, in order to keep the, the canals open to, to all users. We are working very closely with them um, in relation to the challenges that we have seen in, in, in recent times. Uh, that has been partly um, uh, addressed through some additional funding that Transport Scotland Scottish Ministers have been able to give. We are also looking at uh, how we can help them um, with funding on, on other um, areas in, in the future. I think one of the things that we, we have, uh, I think it is important to highlight, is that the work that they've undertaken that has identified the asset management backlog is a responsible piece of work that they've, they've done. Um, the assets are ageing, they are complex, um, and, and it's important that they have an understanding of, of the work they need to do to make sure that the structures are there for, for the future. So. The legal point was, that, was the bill, that you, was the legislation you referred to, the C22 Act. I mean, as I understand it, there is no requirement for the board <laughs> <coughs> to ensure that the canals are navigable. Um, and that's my question. Should we not be using this transport bill as an opportunity to give that responsibility to the enlarged board to ensure that our Scottish canals are kept navigable? My understanding is that the existing legislation does have a responsibility for the canals to be kept navigable. It does. And that's, that's my understanding of how the legislation could we, could operates we just, at the moment. Could we just perhaps check with the government? Check that and let us know. I, I think one of the issues that uh, has been mentioned to various people is, is, is the issue that the, the Canal Board is investing in, in properties uh, such as holiday lettings and shops and uh, things such as that rather than investing in canals. So I think it would be useful to, for, for the committee to have some uh, feedback on that. Mike, is that the. the um, I think we've. I, I mean, it, Chris, I'll let you come back on that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly that's been a point that's been raised with us in engagement with stakeholders, I think, particularly in light of, of the challenge we have at the moment. Um, I've asked Scottish Canals to actually undertake a piece of work on this because that challenge has been put to them a number of times that they're spending money and attention on non-canal related activities. I think what's important to note is that the income generated from those non-canal activities or related activities actually do come back in on both an annual basis and indeed in growing the investment pot they have to support the canals going forward. I've asked them to do some work on that to, to make those points clearer to people because I think, I think it's important that that, that is recognised. Uh, and all businesses know that the, the core asset is what you invest in, not necessarily the ones that generate long-term uh, income. And I, I'll, I'll leave it there if I may. I, I, I'd like to thank uh, all of those who've given evidence this morning on, on the three uh, panels. Um, Tasha, there are various questions that uh, we didn't get through, which is uh, very much where I anticipated we'd be at the end of the meeting. And uh, the clerks will, uh, uh, subject uh, to everyone agreeing, submit those questions to you and, and the committee would ask that you respond to them. Um, uh, through the clerks, just so we can get the, an indication of, of uh, uh, sorry, of get your answers to those questions as we go forward. I'm actually going to ask you to remain in place while we deal with the next item of business, um, uh, because after that we'll be moving into private session, and, and it doesn't seem appropriate to break. So we're going to move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation, and and that is uh, the consideration of one negative instrument on the scalpy scallops. Uh, negative instrument. The, the instrument grants an exclusive right to fish for scallops in the area of Scalpy Island near the Isle of Skye. The Scottish Government wrote to the committee to clarify several points which I'd raised as the committee convener. We have received no motions to annul in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Agreed. That is agreed. And thank you for that. And the committee will now move into private session. Could I ask committee members to be to take a five-minute break and then return to their seats? Thank you.